Greetings, it is I, Mixie, and I'm back with a review for episode 2 of Masters of the Universe Revolution. No, not Revulsion, Revolution. You're thinking of the previous season. Remember, I gave this second season a 5 out of 10, so it's not terrible, just mediocre. If you missed that earlier full season review, just hit that subscribe button and you won't miss anything else. Episode 2 of Masters of the Universe Revolution is a bit better than the previous episode. We set up some goals for our heroes, and the villains have moved their pieces into place for their final attack. However, this episode does raise some issues about the intelligence of their plans. Things seem to be headed one way, and then they do a complete 180 and head the other for no apparent reason. The rules of succession are brought into question in this episode, and while the rules are changed, it seems they are changed in a way that best suits the story, rather than a way that seems more fair. Again, the animation is top notch, and the character designs look good. I still won't let go of my wish that they could use the 1980s models, but what are you going to do about it? This episode is a 6 out of 10. There's some middling action sequences punctuated by lots of people carrying on conversations mid-battle. The aftermath of the battle is never really explored, more glossed over while other things are attended to. People seemingly travel from one side of the continent to the other instantaneously, while also not being aware of events that have taken place on the other side of the planet. They tried to get a bit too clever with the story and give everyone something to do, which didn't really work out in the end. It's the kind of episode you think is okay, but later when you're in the shower you think to yourself, wait a minute. And now, onto the spoiler section. Episode 2 opens with a young Keldor and Randor being naughty boys and snooping around their father King Miro's office, seemingly to get at his secret stash of wine. Why a king would need a secret stash of wine is anyone's guess, although their outfits do seem to bear some Middle Eastern hallmarks, so maybe their culture shuns alcohol. Did anyone else notice a seemingly low frame rate on this flashback? Is that for dramatic effect or is it just a money saving exercise? Anyway, Miro must have knocked up a smurf because Keldor is Randor's older bastard brother. For unknown reasons, the Queen is going to bat for him, saying he's a rightful heir. She's telling Miro to change the law to allow him to be king. Surely she would want him gone and Randor to ascend undisputed. Flash forward to present day, Keldor is telling Adam about his life. Wait, Hordak has already conquered one continent on Eternia? Why wouldn't they conquer the whole planet? Is the planet so massive that they wouldn't know what's happening on the other side? They have planes, but I digress. Keldor seems to be around 35 while Adam is late teens. He doesn't look older than Randor. I guess we can put that down to the advanced Gar physiology. So according to this episode, Randor only had an issue with Adam being King and He-Man. He could be King and go on adventures, but not as He-Man. Neither Keldor nor Adam want to rule, but one of them has to. Again. Why not let the Queen? But hey, who am I to question Eternian sovereignty? Just then, Skeletor attacks. We get another one of Chris Wood's operatic I HAVE THE POWERS! And BAM! Smash cut to Teela. Oh, you were here to see He-Man and you finally got it? Well, that two second glimpse is enough. Now on to the star of the show, Teela. She's in some castle looking for clues about the towers. And who should show up but Granamir? That voice is familiar. Ah uh, yeah, it's Q from Star Trek The Next Generation, one of the best Star Trek characters until he was assassinated in Picard, but I think we can all agree that show doesn't exist. Granamir has a weird line here where he contradicts himself. He says something akin to, I used to be able to be swayed by words, but now I can't, so you better start talking. So you're saying that you still can be swayed by words. Shouldn't you be telling her she's wasting her time? Teela wants the snake magic but it seems that Evelyn has beat her to it. At least I think it's Evelyn. It's voiced by Lena Headey. No. No. I'm not going to call him Skeletech. Clearly Skeletor is the same old buffoon, as he has nanobot bombs that turn anyone they touch into zombies obedient to Skeletor. And instead of dropping them from the air, they decide that a ground assault is the best option. These bombs then activate ancient mechanical behemoths buried underneath Eternia. How very convenient. It seems that they required a mind control citizen to take a swipe at He-Man and miss. 
thereby creating a crater that the nanobots can use to enter the Earth to activate these technological terrors. I'm totally not getting Majora's Mask vibes from this thing. So He-Man goes off to chase Skeletor, thereby giving everyone an opportunity to watch Kaldor lead like the true ruler he is. Meanwhile, He-Man discovers that the power somehow gives immunity to the nanobots. Kind of like a vaccine. Topical. Keldor upgrades Man-at-Arms, Andra's, gauntlet using GAR technology, and they use it to upload a virus to the Tech Titan. But of course, it fails at 99%. Like me burning a CD in 2001. Keldor uploads the rest of the virus to Man-at-Arms' blaster. But she's afraid that she'll miss. Well, Keldor gives her the positive affirmation that she needs to realise she's the best. Man, Lucky Keldor was there or Eternos would have been completely overrun. Even He-Man has to give a knowing acknowledgement. We're back with Teela trying to get snake magic off Granamia, and John Delancey gets to give another speech about how humans are such horrible creatures. Typecast much? Wait, so the people of Eternos who got affected with Motherboard's virus are still infected? Why aren't they storming the castle? But He-Man tells Man-at-Arms, Orko and Duncan that the Power Sword can disinfect people but it needs to be amplified. Duncan knows of only one person who can do that. Don't tell me, it's not. Battle Cat opens up to He-Man about how much he enjoys being Battle Cat and He-Man just turns his back on him. At least give him a pat. Adam crowns Keldor as King Keldor the first. And while Adam embraces his poor overlooked mother in the background, Keldor gives us a suspicious smirk like a DreamWorks animated character. Evelyn convinces Grenomir that he's going to hell because he gave humans the power to wage war on each other. So if he helps Teela, he can be redeemed. But can you be redeemed if you do good things purely for selfish reasons? I don't know how Scareglow's rules work. So Grenomir asks Teela a simple riddle, and that is enough to convince him that Teela is worthy of a third level of power. So now she has her natural abilities as Captain of the Guard. She has the sorceress powers with an extra ability to leave Castle Grayskull. And now she has the power of Kar, the snake powers. She's really got to catch them all. But hell, at least we get a little bit of cleavage. Small mercies. The final scene is Skeletor being revealed to actually be Motherboard. It was all just a dream. And Keldor is Skeletor. Not really a surprise to anyone who has watched the previous iterations. This isn't a terrible episode. There's a fair bit happening, the revelation of Keldor's existence, Motherboard's attack on Eternos, the contamination of its people with the Motherboard virus, and Teela's quest for power. We've got some stakes, we've set the pieces on the board, and now it's time for the game to really begin. As I mentioned, I'm going to give Episode 2 of Masters of the Universe Revolution a 6 out of 10. The whole He-Man can't rule rule is a little weird, as I feel like all the prior kings were warriors as well just that they weren't the champions of Eternia. Doesn't that make it easier for Adam? I mean, he has fabulous powers that basically make him invincible. Not that you'd know from this iteration of Masters of the Universe. Keldor turning up just as the coronation is due is very suspicious. We're told he'd been banished and that it was illegal for him to return, but here he is and he's welcomed with open arms, straight into a room with the heir for a little alone time. I also have to question why Motherboard's plan was to have Keldor stop the attack. It all seemed to be going perfectly. They were marching into Eternos basically unopposed, and their plant thwarted their attempts to conquer the city. Now, the obvious answer is, they get better results if the kingdom was handed over willingly. But how long is that going to last? How long does Skeletor have to pretend to be Kaldor until his true motivations come out? 10 years? 20 years? Is he there to open the gate when Hordak arrives? Why stop them from marching in on the first attempt? There's just something in the pit of my stomach that tells me that all of this is leading up to a big nothing. What is Teela doing collecting all of the powers? Creating heaven for King Randor? Is that in some way going to help repel the invasion of Eternos by Skeletor? Hordak allegedly already has conquered the Gar side of the planet. Does nobody know about this? How is Kaldor travelling from Eternos to Snake Mountain without being seen? He should be under surveillance by the Royal Guard. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing. I release reviews occasionally when time allows, and a thumbs up would be a big motivator for further reviews. If you didn't like it, feel free to leave a thumbs down and let me know how I can improve in the comments below. 
Anyway, I'm Mixie. Thanks for your time and have a good one.